Again, friends, we want to thank you for joining us at the Touching Hearts Ministry Church located in West Frankfort, Illinois, in the southern part of Illinois. Thank you for joining. Uh, if you're on our website, uh, I just know that you're going to be touched by this message. Maybe you're watching us today on YouTube. And then our other friends that we've sent out our DVDs, thank you so much for your support. Not only in your prayers, but you've helped us so much financially it's, it's sort of strange Kathy sometimes we'll get a check for a hundred dollars or fifty dollars and it just comes at the right time and I call my folks and say man this just came at the right time and and then the financial help even within our church Carolyn that we've received in the last year has kept us going kept us alive it seemed like the Lord sent our folks in just when we really needed the help to continue and by the way uh, those that are viewing in, we're going to be celebrating our 15th year in our ministry in October. So we're going to have a special dedication that day. We're going to be inviting different folks from the Adventist churches in the area. 15 years of serving Jesus Christ. And this month, June, Brenda, our church turned three years old. Praise the Lord for that. So anyway, thank you for joining us today. I know you're going to be touched by the message. It's called the futility of force. There are women out there that are viewing this program. Uh, unfortunately, you may have had a husband or have one even now that tries to force you to love and respect him by physical force or maybe emotional. That doesn't work very well, does it? We're going to find out that force comes by that love will enforce uh, obedience within us. It will allow us to obey God, not because we have to, not because he's forcing us, because... We love him. We're going to find out more about that today. But as always at our church, we want to ask that the Holy Spirit come and touch our hearts and guide us and direct us in this message. Heavenly Father, this is your day that you set aside. And Lord, we thank you so much that we've come together on the seventh day, which is your Sabbath as well, to praise and honor you and uplift the lovely name of Jesus. Lord, would you be with this message today? It's sort of a complicated message, but the Holy Spirit can make it simple to understand and even for me as well as I tried to grasp the theme of this message, the futility of force. Thank you for this message. Touch each and every one that came to our church here today and those on the other side of the camera, our friends out there. Would you touch their hearts today? In the name of Jesus, amen. If you will turn in your Bibles and those that are viewing in, you might want to jot down some of these scriptures on a pad and go over these scriptures when we go off the air today. It's called the futility of force. And let's go to Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, Verses 13, and Bob, here's what the Bible says. I didn't say it. This is what the Bible says. Jeremiah says, and ye shall seek me, God says. And God says, when you seek me with a whole heart, you will find me. When you search, listen, search for me with all of your heart. And I'm going to break that scripture down. Let me read this to you. God makes a wonderful promise in this scripture. He makes it so that his words are plainly understood. Here's what he's saying. I will not force myself upon you. But <laughs> if you seek me with your whole heart, then I will provide an avenue, Kathy, that you might find me. Isn't that awesome? God promises anyone, black, white, any nationality, anyone on this planet, if you will seek me, you will find me if you seek me with your whole heart. And again, if you'll read in Deuteronomy 4.29, write this scripture down as well. Deuteronomy 4.29, here's what it says. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, you will find him. If you Listen, if you will seek him with your whole heart and with all your heart, mind, and soul, God promises you will find him. We're going to find out today that God never forces His will upon you. He never forces His love upon you. He never forces any kind of uh, positive or negative force upon you. He will never, ever force you to serve or love Him. We're going to find out today that if you find someone trying to force themselves upon you, the devil's behind it. Is anybody with me? You're going to find that out today as we go a little bit further. Let me read this to you. One who seeks God must seek Him with sincerity of heart, a pure heart, 
listen to this, not seeking God for these reasons, not seeking God for financial gain or specifically to be delivered from an unfortunate circumstance, but from a heart who is lost and truly desires to be united with the one who loves them and whose motive is to save and heal the brokenhearted. You know, we had a special prayer service in our service today, which we believe in the power of prayer and healing as well. And my sister Kathy, we had prayer for her eyesight. And those are on the other side of that camera, if you will remember my sister Kathy in prayer today, who is uh, slowly but surely, Carolyn, losing her eyesight. We had prayer that God will work an avenue and heal her. Now, she didn't come today for any financial gain or even had God heal her today. She came to praise the lovely Jesus Christ. And because she came today, she's going to be blessed because we prayed for her today. And I expect a great miracle because it says here that God's desire is to save and heal the brokenhearted. Let's go a bit, fine, a bit further. We will find today in this sermon, I wrote it down, Brendan, because I didn't want to forget, that God is not, let me say it again, is not a God of force. Force will never, listen to this, women and men, Force will never produce respect or love. <laughs> we talked about there are men in our world today, and I don't have a whole lot of respect for them. I'll just put it out there for y'all. That try to physically force themselves upon their wives and their children, Ben. Force them out of fear to love and respect them. That will never, ever happen. And we're going to find out why a little bit later here. Listen to this. The futility of force. Now, let's break down, Susie, what force is. A futility is. Futility. Unable to produce any positive result. Force will never produce any positive result. Futility. Ineffective in attempts or futility is of little value. Force and it's all, it's futility is of little value. Anytime you try to force anything, it's of little value. In fact, uh, I'm sure, Doug, as you work in woodwork, if you try to force something to fit, something's going to break. Something's going to snap. Something's going to happen that's going to be negative, right? It doesn't work out if you try to force it. You know, one uh, carpenter said, if it, you know, if, if it won't go in, just force it in. Well, unfortunately, it's never going to have any positive results when we try to force. Listen to this. Force in, in the spiritual realm here today, Crystal. Force will not convert. Force will not transform anyone's character. Force is an attribute of the enemy Satan. It is not a characteristic of God to force. Is anybody with me? You're going to say, does it make a difference whether God forces? Yeah, we're going to find out today that it does. Let me turn to the page to my next note. The book is called Reflections of Jesus Christ by Ellen G. White. Does anybody read Ellen G. White? Yeah, sure. Here's what she said. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. Now that makes it perfectly clear, Bob, right there. He desires only the service of love. And love, she said, cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force, she said. It cannot be won by authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love God. <laughs> it cannot be forced. You know, uh, when we were growing up, uh, there were times. Uh, Dad's not here. I can talk about him. He's not here. There's are times that I, that I will put it this way. He had an iron hand. Uh, there were times uh, that he physically forced us to do things. Is anybody with me? I'm not going to say dad beat me, but if I ever needed whooping, buddy, I got thumped real good. He, uh, uh, by force. But it, God says it's not by physical force. In other words, by whooping a child and whooping a child, you're not going to get the respect or love. It's by gentleness and kindness. Is anybody with me? And I think as a child, we learn by our parents' mistakes. Uh, Blake and, and Donnie and Jason and James, Brenda, they're going to learn by our mistakes. We did the best we could in raising them, but we did make mistakes. 
And I think that one, the biggest mistake that parents make is trying to force their authority, force their, uh, maybe even force their love upon their children. And that's not how the Bible says that it works. Listen to this. God knows the futility of force in gaining, listen, of truly repentant souls. The futility of force in the transformation of one, listen, <laughs> love is the, let me put it this way, love is the common denominator in the transformation of character, not force. It is love that transforms the character, not force. Therefore, listen to 1 John 4.16. Here's what the Bible says. And we have known and believed the love of God that God hath loved us. God, he said, is love. And he that dwelleth in God, who seeks God with a whole heart, dwells in God, and God dwells in him. We found out today, if we talked about the ten virgins, and I know that's the whole subject there, but ten virgins, only five had the love and the Holy Spirit of God, and the other five did not. So there is a difference when we talk about love. Listen to this. So love is the common denominator in the transformation of character, and the common denominator is God. <laughs> he is the common denominator. In a letter that, but listen to this. In a letter to one of my favorite speakers, here's what she writes. Can our prayers override the will of another lost individual? Here's what we're saying. Can I, by prayer, force somebody to be saved? By my prayers, can I say, oh God, I know what's best for them. I want you to force your will upon them so that they'll repent. Now that's the question. One lady wrote into this pastor. Can I, by my prayers, can I have God force my son to repent? Listen to this. So the author of the letter asked this question. If I can't force my children to be saved by the power of God, why do I even pray for the unsaved? Why do I? Here's what the pastor says. Here's why you pray. There is a spiritual warfare taking place. Through God's influence, we can bind the power of darkness in prayer. We can bring God's influences to the lost. Is anybody with me? Here's what God does. He doesn't force himself upon you, but he sends the Holy Spirit to talk gently and lovingly to the lost soul. He is inviting them to accept him through his influences, never forcing himself upon them. Let me give you an example of that. And you'll find that in Matthew, the 17th chapter. Write these scriptures down. Matthew, the 17th chapter, verses 14 through 18. This is an example of what I just said. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to Jesus a certain man. And he knelt down before Jesus. And here's what he said. Oh, God, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. I think my dad said that about me several times, Kathy. I think you remember him saying that. But anyway, let's forget that. And he is sore vexed. For oftentimes my son, listen, jumps into a fire. He falleth into a fire. And then sometimes he falls into the water. I had brought him to the disciples and they could not cure him. Kathy, in your instance, there's only so much that medicine can do. Right, Carolyn? There's only so much. But God has a thousand different avenues of healing. So this guy says, I, listen, I have no control over my son. I came to your disciples and they could not heal him. And here's what Jesus said. Oh, you faithless and perverse generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall is I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil. And the devil departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And listen to this. And the disciples said, Jesus, how come we could not cast him out? And Jesus said, because of your unbelief. If we have faith, he said, just a little faith, we can do the impossible. Come on. How be it? This kind that, 
can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. So what was going on, Elaine, in this scripture? Let me break it down for you. Here we have a child who was hopeless and helpless. And apart from somebody else's prayer, there was no hope for him. This was not a case of forcing a child's will, but freeing the child from demonic possession. See what I just said? We were forcing the child. We were relieving the oppression because Jesus cast out the demon that was in him. When we pray, he said, our prayers do not force people to be saved, but free the person to be saved. <laughs> Some folks are under such financial weight. They are under physical ailments. They are under mental or emotional strain. They are literally chained in bondage to these different avenues. So when we pray God to help them, we don't say God force them. We're saying, oh God, free them from this sickness. Free them from this financial bondage or this mental or emotional strain. And then this will allow them to think more clearly. Can somebody help me? That's what we do. That's how that we are to pray. Let's go on. When we pray, again, our prayers do not force people to be saved, but free the person to be saved. Listen to this. God will never force anyone, Adrian Rogers said, Carolyn, to be saved. Force anyone to accept his personal call to salvation. He said if God forced, Bob, one person, he would be obligated to force 7 billion people. <laughs> he can't even force one person. If God forces one to serve him, then he'd have to force seven billion on our planet. And that's not how God operates. Is anybody with me? And I'm going to go through several different circumstances so as to show you today. God doesn't have to use force. God is a God of love. Here's what he says in Matthew 11, 28, 29. God says, come unto me all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He didn't say, I'm coming at you whether you want me or not. He said, come to me. And here's what my favorite author writes, and you know who she is. In these gracious words in the Scripture, Christ extended to the multitude an invitation to come to Him. Walk to Him. Bow down to Him and become a child of the King. Again, Christ did not force His will upon the multitude. He said, come to Me. Well, that's, that's why I love Jesus. Listen to this in Luke 8, 26. And they arrived. And Jesus and his disciples at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee on the eastern shores of the Sea of Galilee. That's the, that's the city of Gadar. They call it the Gadarenes, the country. Listen to this. And when Jesus went forth to the land, as Jesus got out of the boat, as they landed on the shores there of Gadar, it said that the people of Gadar came out to meet Jesus. And in this multitude lane of people, there was a certain man. And the Bible says that this man had devils for a long time. He wore no clothes. He was stark naked. Neither he abode in any house, but he walked and lived in the graveyard in the tombs of that country, possessed by a devil. We find on here the shores of a city called Gadar, and as Jesus steps out of the boat, a man who is possessed by a demon falls at his feet, seeking Jesus' help. Again, Bob, he went to Jesus. He went to Jesus. When the man possessed by demons, C.J., saw Jesus, he cried out, and he fell down before him, and he said with a loud voice, we find, let me break this down. Jesus is getting out of the boat. He's taking his disciples there for a reason. He's about to teach them a lesson. And he takes them to the shores of Gadar. And we call it the land of the Gadarenes. And as Jesus gets out of the boat, a man comes up in the midst of this multitude, and he's stark naked, and he comes up before Jesus and falls at Jesus' feet. Now here's what happens. The demon inside this man recognize who Jesus was. 
And when the man saw Jesus, he cried out and he fell down before him. And with a loud voice, he said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus? And these demons in front of all this multitude, they identify Jesus. They call out, You are the Son of God. Is anybody with me? We're going to find out what we're talking about. We're going to talk about that just because we see miracles, that is not going to transform your character. It's love that transforms character. Listen to this. And the demons identify. And they said, What have we to do with thee, thou Son of God? Jesus, by the Word of God, and not us. Not, <laughs> we're going to find out that Jesus cast the demons into the pigs. And here's what I love of what, what this author said. When Jesus cast the demons out, Carolyn, he didn't use a seance, he didn't use holy water. He didn't use continual chance. He cast out the demons that were in the man by using the Word of God. Can somebody give me on that? <laughs> it wasn't by trickery or hoodwinking or seances or chance or holy water. Jesus spoke and commanded by the Word of God and they had to leave. Now listen, verse 34. It says, when they, the multitude saw that what was done. They fled, and they went and told this miracle even to the Gentiles of that nation in the city of Gadar. And then they went throughout the whole country of the Gadarenes saying, We have seen a miracle. We have heard demons proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God. Now listen to this. I'll read it to you. One author, in describing the events that had just taken place, here's what they wrote. The people should have been grateful for a miracle of massive proportions that was accomplished right before their eyes. Jesus had been identified as the Son of God. By, listen, by the Word of God, Christ cast out of the demons. Now, this man had become, according to history, Carolyn, a legend in that area. He had become a legend as one that was possessed by a legion of demons. One who could not be bound with chains, for he snapped the chains as, they, as if they were sewing thread. He had a, a name. He was a legend. Everyone knew him. But these men were angry because God cleansed this man, cast out the demons, and the demons went into a herd of swine. Is anybody with me? And the herd of swine committed suicide. <laughs> They all ran and went into the water, and the Bible says they choked to death. They drowned themselves, this herd of swine. But here's what happened. They threw the miracle aside as if it was nothing. These men were seeking material prosperity at the expense of true life through Jesus. They chose the pigs over Christ. <laughs> wow. They chose the pigs over Christ who could have and would have offered them eternal life as he would have expounded upon the words and the principles of the Bible. Listen to this. Jesus could have broken the bondage for these Gadarenes, these Gentiles. They had the opportunity to hear the word of God much in advance of the other Gentiles. Remember when Peter went to the house of Cornelius? God said, I want you to take the word now from the Jewish nation, and I want you to go to the Gentiles. In this area of the Gadarenes, Doug, the whole area was nothing but Gentiles. Very few Jews in that area. They had the opportunity to hear the word of God even before Peter took it to Cornelius. Is anybody with me? But because of financial loss, they were so angry that they cast the miracle to the side and they had lost all of their money, and they were absolutely furious. But here's what it says. The multitude said, to, said this to Jesus. Depart from us. You know what Jesus did? He departed. Jesus could have, because of his power and authority, said, I'm not going anywhere. I, you're going to hear what I have to say, and I'm going to force the plan of salvation upon you Gentiles today. But did Jesus do it? He left. Anyone that doesn't want Jesus, he will depart. He will not try to force himself 
upon them. Is anybody with me so far? We're making our point perfectly clear today so far. Listen to this. Being the Son of God, the Redeemer, our Savior, Jesus could have used His authority and forced those in the country of the Gadarenes to sit, to kneel, and listen to the words that would bring salvation. But that is not how the Spirit, that is not how God, that has not how Jesus operates. Again, and I'm going to read this to you. As we stated before, God never forces anyone to accept the plan of salvation. He never forces anyone to accept the plan of salvation or redemption. And yes, even the plan of deliverance through Jesus Christ will never be forced upon anyone. And listen to this. Why doesn't God force people, Kathy? Why doesn't he? Why doesn't he? Force does not obligate one's will to joyfully obey. <laughs> Joy force does not obligate one to commit or submit to the enforcer. It does not allow joy or commitment. Joy and commitment comes through the power of pure love. And that's why God never forces. We're going to find out here, if I haven't already, that Mrs. White said in the Spirit of Prophecy that God's law, His government is based upon love and not force. God's government, God's law, God's principles, even the government in heaven is based upon love and not force. Listen to this. John 18, 3. Judas, having received... Now listen, we're going to go into the garden now. Judas, having received abandoned men and officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, or anyone <laughs> that would come hither with torches, swords, spears, and swords, and all sorts of the then known weapons, he apprehended or took with him into the garden anyone that would go with him to apprehend Jesus. You know the story. Let me read some more. Jesus, therefore, knowing all the things that should come upon him, he knew the beatings, the whip, the lies, the crucifixion, and death. He went forth to this band of men that came into the garden and said, uh, who are you looking for? In other words, what a spectacular entrance into this beautiful garden. Who, listen, Jesus was saying, whoever you seek or hunt must be of great significance. They must be of extreme importance. Otherwise, why such a band of angry men? That was Jesus' thought. And here's what they said. They said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said calmly and with authority, I am He. And as Jesus said, I am, the band of vigilantes went backward and they fell to the ground. You remember that happened? I'd even forgotten that, Elaine. That when Jesus said, I am He, this band of what I call vigilantes, Jan, <laughs> with their spears and their sword, they flew backwards and landed on their buttocks like you did the other night in the kitchen when you fell in the water. They landed not on their knees, but on their buttocks, flat on the ground, and they were forced back with power as if a mighty wind had come. This Here's what it says in the SDA. They fell to the ground. It suggests some manifestation of divinity. The miracle gave further evidence to the murderous mob of the divinity of Jesus Christ. At that moment, they knew we're dealing with the Son of God here. But because of financial gain and prosperity and anger, they overrided the miracle and they took Jesus into captivity. Listen to this. Philippians 2, 9, 10, 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted Jesus. And listen to this. And given Him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Of things in heaven and things in the earth. And things under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And listen to this. This band with their murderous intentions received just a taste of the highly exalted Christ. They not only bowed at the name of Jesus, they were cast to the ground. Thank you, Blake. They got just a taste of a miracle. 
Let's go a bit further. Now, yet SDA conference, uh, Bible says this. Yet this stunning event was just a momentary event. For a few moments later, they carried out a mission and they arrested the Son of God. That's why I always say, a miracle will not transform anybody's character. A miracle will not drive anyone to Jesus. It's only by the lovely hand of Jesus' touch that you'll be converted. That you will want to go to Jesus Christ. And here's what it says in verse 10. I thought this was interesting, Rob. Peter, having a sword, he drew it. And he smote off the high priest's servant. He cut off his right hand. He cut off his right ear, and the servant's name was Malchus. Now, we come to find out, if you go into history, Malchus was one of the high servants of the high priest. He had his right ear cut off. And here's what, here's what Jesus said to Peter. He said, Peter, put up the sword. Put it into your sheath. Matthew 26, 52 says, Jesus said to Peter, Put up again the sword into its place. For all they that take the sword shall perish by the sword. Here's what he said. Peter, thinkest thou not that I cannot pray to my father, and he shall send me twelve legions of angels? We find that in this passage, that even the plan of salvation cannot be accomplished by force. Jesus said, if the plan of redemption was to be accomplished by force, then at this very moment, God would send 72,000 angels to enforce. <laughs> Am I with me? Each legion is 6,000. So if he said the 12 legions, Jesus said, if I wanted to take this planet by force, if I want to force the plan of salvation upon you, I will call upon 72,000 angels to enforce what I want done. Can somebody give me an amen on that? That's not how God works. That's not what God is. That's not who God is. Listen to this. God never, as the writer says, uses force to accomplish His work. He feels no need to use force. For God, Kathy, has thousands of avenues to accomplish the task of the plan of salvation. Here's what Ellen G. White states. God has thousands of avenues diverse methods to accomplish His will, and force is never, ever used. I love that. It's never used. It's not based on force. She said His government and His character is not based upon force. Here's what it says in 1 John. God is love. His every move, His plans, His goals, His desires are based upon this principle love permeates his ever being so i got to thinking about it bob and here's what i wrote mankind makes the attempt to bring god down to our level we try listen plan a crystal susie if plan a doesn't work we go to plan b if this does not accomplish the task we facilitate the use of force Yet the spirit of prophecy says God has thousands of ways. God has thousands of actions. God has thousands of methods of which man has yet to even think of. So I, I ask you this question. Ben, I'll ask you. Do we actually think as man that God has a plan A or B? If that doesn't work, he's perplexed. He don't know what to do. <laughs> oh, boy. These people won't obey me. I've tried plan A and B. I guess I'll send an army in there to stomp them out and bring the hammer down on them. Can somebody help me? I will force these people to love me. I will force these people to respect me. That's not what God is. That's not the Lord that I serve today. Let's go a bit further. Now, men through the centuries. Now, women, men, listen to this. Men through the centuries. I mean, since the beginning of time. They have employed the use of force in marriages to induce their wives and children to love and respect them. In fear or physical harm, the wife or child may display an outward appearance of love, but in the innermost depths of their heart, only resentment and loneliness occupies their heart. Do you agree with me there? 
these men across the ages, if I will absolutely put force, physical force, and I'll make these children, and I'll make these wives love me. That's why in the church we talked about today, CJ, you may have a church of 100 people, but only 50 are prepared for Jesus. With me? Only 50 are already prepared. Could it be, I wrote this, Kathy, our perspective, our analysis, our evaluation involving the inner workings of our Creator could be destructive in nature. Most are of the opinion, and if you listen on the radio, go to 103.9. Go on there. Start at 8.30 in the mornings. Most are of the opinion that even God uses force to gain respect, to install fear into the hearts of the believers and the secular world as well. Are we of the assumption that God uses plans A and B, and if they fail, He's perplexed and does not know what else He to do? So because we don't accept His love, He uses force in all of His totality, and He destroys. Does that make sense to you? You know, Judge Judy says, if it doesn't make sense, it's a lie, and I believe her. She's good. She's good. She has the spirit of evaluation. She knows people. And she said, Susie, if it doesn't make sense, it's a lie. And it doesn't make sense in this case right here. Matthew 5, 38 and 39, Blake. You have heard Jesus said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. How many of you have read that scripture? But I say unto you, Jesus said, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek to him. You remember that scripture? In the Sermon on the Mount, much of the material complements the nature of Jesus and His Father. If You'll read that, the Sermon on the Mount. Mercy, sacrificial love, and long-suffering towards sinners, listen, is the principle on which the kingdom of God is based. I love that. Turn the other cheek. What does that mean? Turn the other cheek refers to personal retaliation. Turning the other cheek means not to return insult with retaliation. That's what that means. Jesus was the perfect example because he was silent before his accusers and did not call down revenge from heaven when he was crucified on the cross. Is anybody with me so far? If, any, if anyone deserved or had the right to retaliate, Jesus did. But Jesus didn't. Here's what Jesus did when he's up on the cross, Bob, when he didn't use to retaliate upon them. He didn't try to force them. You know what he said? He asked God not to retaliate. He asked God not to destroy, not to bring down military force upon those surrounding the cross because his father said, they don't even know what they're doing. Don't bring judgment upon these people, Father. They don't know what they're doing. When Jesus told Peter, to put his sword, in essence, here's what he was saying. Peter, force and violence are not a part of who and what I am. Here's what I am, Peter. I am love. And love exhibit, exhibits mercy and kindness and long-suffering. Love is not vengeful. Love is not militarily aggressive. But it is compassionate. And also, Jesus said, love means your understanding. Jesus was saying, heaven, the kingdom of heaven, the government of heaven, was not based upon illustrating force, but upon true and pure and unchanging love. Can somebody give me an email on that? I would rather serve a God that is allowing me to make up my own mind whether I want to accept Him or not. I want to serve a God that His government is based upon love his government is based upon true and pure and unchanging love. I wish America was built upon that, don't you? But it's not. Lovely Jesus. I pray today, Father, that we have brought out another beautiful, beautiful illustration of your character. You're not a God of force. You're a God of love. You don't force yourself upon folks, but God, you're constantly calling out, Come unto me, all ye that labor, and I will give you rest. I will give you physical rest and mental rest and, and emotional rest. And most of all, I will give you spiritual rest. Come unto me, all you that labor, and I will heal you. 
I will heal the brokenhearted. I will save the prostitute and the drug addict. I will save that wife beater that tried to force his love upon his family. I will save you. I will change your hearts, not by force, but by pure love. I thank you for this message, Father. I pray that someone's life may be changed because of this message. I pray, Father, that those that are viewing it today, that they will see you in a different light of what a merciful and loving and kind and affectionate and compassionate God that you are. I thank you for my folks that came today in our church. What a blessing. Father, what encouragement they have been to our church. I thank you again, Father, for the lovely Jesus. In Jesus' name, Father, my best friend. Amen.